I think the uh, the two countries, China and uh, the United States, you know, everybody needs a buffer. And I think this is one of those buffer issues. Similarly, it's a fantastic opportunity. They both know that between uh, capital investment, technological innovation, that, you know, addressing climate change is a is a very progressive and very strong uh, driver of economic growth. So they both know that. And now it's just a matter of uh, settling the rivalry, as it were, and uh, moving on. The money men and women, the Larry Finks of this Paula, the, the money men and women, the Larry Finks of this world, tell us actually that the private sector not only has to step up, but will step up and can do it profitably as well. But can these two, again, the same kind of question really, can these rivals technologically and industrially uh, both step up at the same time without having uh, huge frictions? And we've seen in other parts earlier on in the climate story that, for instance, in solar, we've seen that actually the Chinese undercutting a lot of the Western players as well. So can they work in harmony going forward? Well, I think, you know, globalization for all of its ups and downs, you know, uh, smooths out some of these things. You have companies operating in both both uh, both markets. Uh, clearly, the Chinese have made huge investments. I mean, I, I helped set up the first carbon market in China. And at the time, there were very few people aware of, of any of these issues. That was only a decade ago. Now they've educated an entire generation to understand carbon markets, which is a planning tool that they've gotten ahead of. And we have fallen behind in the United States, whereas in Europe, of course, you uh, you continue to pioneer carbon pricing. But I think, you know, the, the, the competition can be good in this sense. You can never have enough energy efficiency and undercutting uh, tariffs and sort of um, uh, uh, the uh, the kind of international tax structures. These these would be wise to smooth out to eliminate that kind of fr fringe uh, uh, tension that accompanies all of these international negotiations. But um, I don't know if you any of you are gamblers, but you know when you play a slot machine, what you want is cherries all across. And what we have now is cherries, bananas, and uh, lemons. And the three cherries are science, policy, and capital. When you get those three working together, lining up together you can address climate change. And the public really will come along because there's so many jobs involved, which is, of course, one of the things that President Biden has put at the center of his conversation. And I think he's trying to bring the American public along to some of the investments that uh, have to be made in order for the United States to remain competitive with China. Paula, some of the focus in recent years was on whether the United States was part of the Paris Agreement or not, and now obviously back in, but it didn't allow for much devil in the detail. And there's now this huge focus, of course, as we count down to, to COP to talk about the nationally defined contribution, you know, the percentage of greenhouse gas emissions countries will commit to reducing by 2030. How wide are those percentage levels likely to be, do you think? Oh, I think that we're far from knowing exactly, you know, if you're talking about by the time Glasgow occurs. I mean, remember, this is COP26. That's 26 years. You can add a few at the beginning that they didn't number them. So, you know, we've been working on these uh, these targets for 30 years at least, and now we call them NDCs. But mainly they're a planning tool and, uh, you know, it remains to be seen. But I think there'll be um, significant focus on trying to get um, exponentially forward on the problem by 2030. You know, a lot of companies are setting 2050 goals, but that's easy to promise. 2030 is the turning point. What is it that stiffens backbones at this point, uh, Paula? I mean, you look at things like the Texas chill and the rolling blackouts that was the consequence there, and you ask questions about the, uh, the strength maybe of the infrastructure in the United States in some particular states. Again, taking on board your points about China, still more than 60% of their power comes from carbon-based fuels. It's very slow, isn't it? They talk the talk, but is everybody walking the walk? Well, that's the truth test, you know, and that's where international collaboration, international power, investors, you know, I don't uh, want to focus so much on the United States, but today one in three dollars is uh, screened for some form of environmental or social or governance factor, and that includes money invested in China, uh, uh, or rather by people investing in China. So here we have one in three dollars that's up uh, from one in five just since the Paris Agreement in 2015. So so you have, you have people who are holding other people's feet to the fire. Now, it's not perfect, and it's not enough, but uh, I think there's momentum there. And um, it's for all of us, and particularly, again, back to the United States, to get the American people on board 
with some of the changes we need to make, including a national carbon price. If the United States had a national carbon price, then that would, you know, you, it's, it's kind of like a, um, I mean, this is a bilateral negotiation almost at this point. The United States puts something on the table, China puts something else. That's just what happened in Paris when the Obama administration worked closely with China, and China did come to the table. And now John Kerry is uh, trying to do the same, but, you know, we have four years to make up for.